So we'd like to welcome everyone to our um, group for thought presentation for September. Um, just a brief introduction. Uh, we are going to be recording today's session. So if we're talking about tips for managing classrooms, um, I would just remind everyone we'll keep um, any personal stories anonymous and not include any identifying um, information about um, anybody who may or may not be involved in any of the stories that we're, um, we're discussing. So. Um, that's all that I'm going to say at this point. I'm going to turn it over to our speaker who will be introducing themselves on behalf of the top. We collaborated, uh, so Karen from Student Conduct, Natalie from CAPS, and myself from Student Care and Advocacy. We collaborate all the time, but we um, all sometimes uh, at different times might receive <clears throat> requests for help from faculty or advisors um, or anyone kind of working with students who might notice um, that. Uh, for whatever reason, maybe um, things are being said or behaviors happening in a residential classroom environment or even online classroom environment that's leaving others unsettled and might just need help knowing exactly kind of where to go and what to manage on their own, what to report and things like that. So we put this presentation together um, and I'm going to kick us off <clears throat> um, and I'm going to go through the first slides pretty um, pretty quickly because the, the meat of the presentation is in the middle, but just contextually, next slide. Um, we, uh, a lot, I'll just kind of keep talking. <laughs> today's, uh, so, okay, so the evolution of today's college classroom, because I don't think we can talk about classroom management or working with students um, and just kind of assume that the variables involved are the same as they always have been, because the classroom has really, really changed. Um, I've, I've captured um, some pictures that kind of represent that a little bit. I mean, it's changed generally, like who's in the classroom, who has access to be in the classroom, who is like equipped leading up to throughout K through 12 to even be able to kind of keep up and engage with this type of work, who can afford it. Um, and even, um, you know, the classroom itself physically has changed um, where classes meet, how often, in what ways, and also um, whether or not it's in person or online. So that's just kind of creates this environment that makes managing a classroom and engaging in civil discourse. And we all say like the best thing for, you know, um, frustrating speech or offensive speech is just more speech, but sometimes it's hard to, to create an environment that everyone feels comfortable doing that, to train faculty, to be comfortable with those kind of conversations. So just be mindful of the evolution of the college classroom in general. Um, then next slide. And I, in my area, I, I use this diagram a little bit just to reference something that's really familiar in student affairs, which is we're working with students. They, you know, they learn a lot in the classroom, but they learn a whole lot outside of the classroom as well as they're meeting new people in a new environment and figuring out kind of like how they feel about things separate from maybe the environment with, with, within which they grew up. And so we want to make sure to challenge them, but also make sure that we're blending with a nice level of support. So anytime a student is kind of under challenged, um, they might, and like super, super comfortable with what's happening, they may become bored. And we, we as people that work with students don't want them to do that because they might um, really kind of act out or just kind of um, disengage and we might kind of lose them. Um, but also, if they're so exhausted and challenged, but don't feel supported, they might start to panic, which we also don't want. So as you think about the students that you're interacting with in the classroom and otherwise, try to do what you can to aim for that middle zone of peak performance so that they're certainly challenged. And that's where we learn the most, right, when we're like a little bit outside of our comfort zone. Um, but also know at least where to go should they need assistance. Even sometimes the students I work with, even just knowing that there is someone dedicated to kind of being their person in whatever way um, comforts them and they might not even really have to tap into that resource all that much. Um, so given that, next slide, and I'll reference that diagram again. Um, there's research done out of, um, within CAPS is the, um, CCMH, um, the College the Center for Collegiate Thank Mental Health. Thank you. Um, they are, um, they were able to recently and on a regular basis kind of pull data that's coming from um, not just Penn State, but 
across the nation, um, maybe even outside of the United States, I'm not sure. Yeah, there, there's, it's a research practice network of over 500 universities that has a constant feedback loop of data that come from collegiate mental health and then get fed back into the clinical practice so that we're able to learn so much at every single session about what students are reporting about their levels of distress, the various diagnoses that they might need criteria for. Um, and yes, it is outside of the US now, um, and that's an ever-growing population. So it's run by um, Ben Locke, who's our director at CAPS. Um, so it's cool that it's housed right here, kind of in our own backyard, but this kind of captures what students um, that you're working with are experiencing. So if you think back to that, that bell curve, um, more, almost, almost all, a significant majority report feeling overwhelmed and feeling really, really exhausted, kind of the challenge is too much. And that is when a student may kind of flippantly say something they don't mean in class or do something that kind of concerns other people. Um, and so, and, or, you know, um, just be concerning, kind of uh, relieve that stress and cope in, in not always healthy ways. Um, then 62% report feeling very sad and lonely. And sometimes that's visible and evident. Um, sometimes it's not. I, I feel for instructors that are teaching online because they don't get that face to face time and get to um, kind of pick up on some nonverbals that might co not come through in content. Um, uh, right around half report feeling overwhelmingly anxious and hopeless. So we all know that a healthy level of anxiety, like if you think back to that bell curve, is right there in the middle to be kind of driven to complete things um, that can kind of be a healthy fuel to the fire. But if, it, um, if it's more of like a lonely anxious or just a constant worrying and wondering, that could be distracting from being productive. And then a little less than half feel hopeless. 32% um, um, report feeling so depressed that it's difficult to function. I know on, on my team, we use uh, just kind of internally when we're working with students, we use a scale and we ask how, how much is this event or this situation impacting your ability to kind of complete daily tasks? Because as you all know, uh, um, a B in a course could, or on an assignment could really inhibit a person from being able to complete daily tasks because that just kind of rocks their world for whatever reason when someone else might lose a parent and they're completely able to function because of different supports in place or, or whatever. So we kind of just try to meet the student where they are in terms of how much whatever is impacting them is um, interfering with their ability to function. And then 8% probably is the least surprising statistic on here for me, just because we do end up working with a lot of students that are at their wits end enough that you're they're actually considering kind of ending it versus finding an alternative. So these are kind of, these are just, this is a snapshot of the students that are in our classrooms today. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Is it, is this of all students or of all students who work with the mental this health? Is, this is all question. students who seek counseling at university counseling okay, centers. Okay, because I'd be really concerned if 32% of all college students felt hopeless. Okay. No, it's only <laughs> yeah. capturing okay. students who seek Good. services, but it does right. sort of tell you how the, how the field has changed because right. a lot of people, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, who were interested in working in collegiate mental health thought that they were going to be dealing with adjustment <clears throat> disorders, you know, relationship breakup, like grief about leaving home. And you can see that it's much, it starts to look a lot more representative of the population for what, what people are coming and seeking help for from, from a counseling agency. Right. Okay. And, and I think that, you know, I, I don't know if we've ever did a study, did a study of some of the students who may act out in the classroom and what percentage of those students are, are already seeking services or mm -hmm. um, because I think important to know that uh, these are there are resources mm -hmm. and, and I think that sometimes the first time we we hear about a student who may be struggling is in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so it, good to get a sense for it. if if they were to report or indicate any of these things. These are the kinds of services that they could reach out for help. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and knowing that there, there is this healthy level of challenge in being out of their comfort zone, an exacerbating factor that would kick a student from being in that middle zone to being more like panicked is um, if they don't feel like they have hope or they don't feel like they have an outlet or support. And so that's where also faculty and staff can be really helpful just as identifying themselves as somewhere to go. It could keep people kind of certainly going through stressful times but able to manage it better. Um, 
And given all that, knowing that these are the students that you all are working with um, and the level of training and just natural comfort level that um, faculty and staff have working with students going through challenging times or just in general acting out, um, maybe just being disrespectful for whatever reason, um, we try to kind of break the behaviors down into three categories to help faculty especially identify which category the behavior falls in to help decide where to where to kind of go or what action to take. So the three categories are, and Natalie's going to go through a couple, you know, um, examples and practical application, but distracting, so distracting behaviors, behaviors that can be managed without really needing to rush to, to report them or kind of take themselves out of the equation and have someone else contact the student and kind of convey that that wasn't okay. So manage directly. Um, and then the second category would be disruptive. Behaviors to certainly manage and address them in either real time or as a follow up in a timely way. Um, and also report and that could be, you know, sharing with a colleague or a supervisor to just, you know, as a department kind of I want to put this interaction or student on our radar and kind of come up with a plan to prevent a pattern or dangerous uh, behaviors to report. And when I was talking with Karen earlier today, she said one, one behavior that initially is just distracting, if it becomes a pattern, you could quickly become in, in the category of disruptive or even dangerous where you wouldn't want to even try to manage it anymore. Somebody else just kind of needs to um, be able to intervene from a, from a safety perspective. And, and I, I would just add to that. So uh, you know, one of the things we think about in terms of behavior is you're kind of starting as you look at these things, this is kind of like, this is the first time this has happened, right? So if this is a student you have a history with, then it may very well be that how you interpret that same behavior may be different for one than it is for the other. Mm -hmm. So as we're talking about assessing the behavior, it you have a contextual thing that's really not part of this that you're gonna to wanna to add to this. Um, that may get you in a place where something that we're talking about baseline is distracting feels really different. So I think as we talk about these things, we're talking about them from the context of this is the first interaction you've had with the student. This is this is the first time they presented in this way, um, because multiple times may make a difference. Okay, and then I'm going to hand it over to Natalie. I'm wondering if because we are tagging each other so much, if I should just come over here so you don't you know what? have the camera. Why don't we swap? Does that feel okay to you? Why don't sure. you and I swap spots you. because you're that really fine. I can actually yeah. just I know, but they're so panning like, past me every single corner. time, so. I can <laughs> certainly. Get out of the way, Steve. Get out of the way. <laughs> Sorry about that. I know I'm on camera all the time. That doesn't seem fair. <laughs> Yes, that's what we'll review right now. I imagine. <laughs> and these are not all inclusive. There are so say, a number of other behaviors that use criteria. And if you have ah, ones in particular you'd want to talk about, yeah. that would be helpful. So the first um, sort of set of examples we'll review is some things around um, free speech, which comes up a lot in the classroom. What are students allowed to say? What feels like things that can be sort of provocative or inflammatory? And how would we categorize those various things? So we took something that sometimes happens in a classroom where perhaps someone is bringing up content that isn't really relevant to the um, actual content of the course. So maybe someone's sitting in a course talking about statistics, but one of the statistics examples has to do with pregnancy and all of a sudden a student starts to talk sort of at length about their views on abortion. We would consider that kind of in the distracting category. It doesn't have anything to do with the content being offered and it really feels off topic and is pretty provocative. So we would look at this as an option for a sort of a management strategy. So what might a faculty member do to sort of redirect a student? That's not actually the content we're talking about. Like let's get back to the statistics part, you know, the reason that we're at this at this sort of juncture and see if that remedies the situation. And we, so that's sort of that first category, okay? Moving along to disruptive, perhaps someone in the class um, responds to that student or the student is aware of another student in the class who's had an abortion and calls out a student and says, you know, I can't believe you would do that. I totally disagree with that. That's against my religious beliefs. We would start to look at this as more disruptive. Maybe they've already tried to manage the behavior and it has not been successful and now it's escalating. So this would be more in the category 
category of what Anna just described, where you may be wanting to seek some consultation. So I tried to manage it. This is what I've tried. Let me get some other ideas of what I can do. It might even be something that you put on your department's radar. Like this is happening. This is really unusual that the student is acting out this way. And on the other end of the continuum dangerous, um, a student who might threaten someone openly in class, you know, I have knowledge that you're going to go have an abortion this weekend and I'm going to do everything in my power to stop you. That would not be a time that we would want you to manage the situation. And I think hopefully individuals know that, but that is a threat. I mean, that is a, a clearly articulated threat that we would want to report to the proper resources and we'll review all those resources. But um, that may be one that I would probably be calling police on, probably behavioral threat management team, and then probably doing a referral to Anna's office for the person who was threatened or to our office to counseling and psychological services um, to do some advocacy perhaps for that person and probably GenEC too. Um, but that's that's sort of how we are going to review some various examples. Any questions on this one before we move on to another example? No? Okay. Um, the next one is about emotional distress and when people are um, having threat to self or suicidal kind of language. And Anna and I talked about um, wanting to do something that felt like it would um, be informed by the new way that in students are interacting with course materials. So a lot more about the technology aspect of when students say these sorts of things. So distracting, perhaps using the online forum in Canvas that you were hoping there was going to be some discussion about course content to be talking about getting support over a breakup. That would be something we would hope that an instructor would manage because it's very distracting. The student needs redirected to what, what actually the purpose of this forum is um, and maybe even a resource. Like here, it sounds like you're going through something difficult. I wanna make you aware of your resources, but for, for the purpose of this class, that's not an appropriate use of this forum. Disruptive would be disengaging from the required online discussion and then maybe making a vague statement that starts to get the classmates very worried. They mention that they can't go on. And so um, this is something that elevates our concern for the student and again would be something we would want you to be seeking consultation on typically. Um, and like Karen said, this would really be most applicable for someone who like this is a brand new student to you. This isn't someone you have a history with. And the other end of the continuum, posting suicide plan to a shared online message board, which sometimes students do. You know, tonight it's done for me. I'm, I'm planning on doing this. I'm planning on taking my life. We would actually want that to be elevated very quickly to letting folks know and, and letting the police know that someone has made a clear threat to themselves. It's actually the fastest way we can locate a student. We're always happy to help and um, facilitate a wellness check, but actually telling the police that someone has made that um, statement is a quick way. If they're an online student mm -hmm. and they live in Michigan, mm -hmm. Same thing, mm -hmm. call the Michigan police or call the local police. You can actually call them. the local police and seek advice. Okay. Um, we have a world campus case manager at our office and she actually manages a lot of the world campus students that are spread out across the, not just the country, but across the world with sort of obtaining the resources that so are needed. So you need in a wellness check, you reach out to that person or you just call the police? I usually have called the police. The, the police actually one. are the ones that facilitate a wellness check okay. and a police to police contact is okay. actually a pretty smooth thing to have happen. Okay. Like we're at University Park, we've got a student in Detroit, you know, here's the on the ground, this is the local address we have, we need a wellness check. That's a pretty common um, language for police to use. Um, and for crisis workers to use that what you're really trying to do is go out and assess the situation and you are worried that somebody's a danger to themselves at that moment. Does that make sense? Yes. Questions on, on that example? Are you getting uh, students that are having these? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was yep. gonna say, I even call university police if I have a student just in Ferguson Township or something. They just, it, it's very routine and it's, mm -hmm. it's a good hub so you don't have to figure out who to call. You just always call our Okay. Um, this one is another one um, with using technology and this is for a misuse of technology. Mm -hmm. So for perhaps you're in your classroom and I know a lot of students take notes on their laptops, you know, have their phones open and they're doing various things with them. Um, so distracting might be someone who is texting explicit content during class time. You're sort of monitoring the classroom, maybe something's going on that you need to have eyes on the students, and um, you notice that someone's texting something that looks clearly inappropriate. Maybe there's inappropriate pictures, maybe there's language that looks really inappropriate. And so again, this would be like a, let's course correct right here and see if we can manage this behavior. Let the student know that's not appropriate. You know, I need you to put, I need you to put that away. You know, you can't be looking at things like that during class time. Um, and you see sort of what the reaction is. Many students would be like, oh gosh, I got caught. And they would, you know, put their phone away. And that would be what we would want the student to do is to be able to be redirected. 
Sometimes though, the behavior would turn more disruptive. Perhaps you're, you're again monitoring the classroom or students are supposed to be doing something on their computer either in, you know, individually or collaborative and the student is actually watching pornography and other students can see and hear what's happening in your course. Does that actually um, happen? <laughs> pretty, mu pretty much everything None that you can imagine, <laughs> everything okay. that you can imagine happens, happens. Wow. Okay. Um, so. I've been sheltered. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminding myself I'm being recorded, so I'm trying to keep my, my, my commentary to a minimum because I have a <laughs> um, so, yeah. it, Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, this would be something that's clearly disruptive. Now other students have viewed it. This could turn into a Title IX violation because other students are, are having to be witness to this. So it is, it is a moment to not just manage, but to actually report and, and to get some consultation about what should that reporting even look like? Is this, you know, is this to Title IX? Who else should I consult with? And so, again, when we review all of our options, Title IX is an option here. And then um, moving over to dangerous, someone who's masturbating during class while watching pornography. This is, this is not something we would want a faculty member to intervene with. Like we would want you to sort of do what you can to minimize the impact on the other students, get the other students out and call the police because that is, that is not okay to be happening in a classroom environment. So yes, all of these are, are loosely based um, on de-identified examples. But yeah, these are, yeah, these are things that happen. Um, but remember, it's not someone, it's not always just, um, being aloof or disrespect, it could they could be engaging in this behavior because of a mental health related illness, and so all the more reason to kind of get them connected with us. Um, yep, absolutely, and all the more reason maybe not to engage in that mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people may do behavior like this. Sometimes it's traumatic brain injury. Sometimes it's early set um, stage of psychosis, and so these aren't situations where we would be wanting you to engage right away. We'd actually want you to kind of you know minimize the impact on the rest of the students. Keep yourself safe. That's always the most important thing, and then get assistance. And so um, I'm going to be handing out something um, in just a little bit, but it has. Um, sort of a three-step model that, that sort of mirrors our distracting, disruptive, dangerous, which is recognize, respond, refer. And so on that dangerous side, we're almost always looking for a referral. Mm -hmm. Questions on this example? Okay. And then um, disrespect, disregard, and dangerousness. So on the distracting side of the equation, perhaps a student is doing a lot of passive aggressive nonverbals, lots of eye rolls, maybe some snide comments. Um, you're trying to engage them. You're sort of using all of that great skill that you might have and nothing. You know, you speak to them and it just falls completely flat. So that would be really distracting. The rest of the class is aware of it, you're aware of it, and you're gonna try and manage it. So you might do a, a reminder. Um, there is a participation, you know, grade in this course. I just wanna give you a reminder. I wanna remind you that when I'm speaking to you, if you could please respond to me. And if you choose not to, if you could just stick around after class so you and I can figure out what's going on. And you know, any sort of intervention you can do at this stage to manage is great because then we're looking for what is the reaction from the student. Most of the time, the students are gonna respond like, oh, sorry, I'm going through a terrible thing. You know, I'm not trying to be rude to you. And, and students will kind of come back online and that's what we want. Um, perhaps though the student is starting to get more disruptive. So now not only is the student doing the distracting behavior, but they're actually fiddling with a switchblade or doing some sort of something that appears a little bit more dangerous to you during class. That is something that we would we would put more in a category of we're going to get some consultation about. You should probably tell your department and you should probably get some consultation on what to do with that student because that is concerning and very, it's a couple standard deviations outside of normal student behavior, right? Typical student behavior. And then on the dangerous side, perhaps this, you, you emerge from the classroom, the student's pacing outside and muttering like some things under their breath, like you know, kill or hurt or something like that. Do not engage with the student. We would just want you to go ahead and make a referral at that point. So um, we would put that person absolutely in some sort of a dangerous category. Whether they're aware of the impact of their behavior, it doesn't matter. That is a, that is a scary thing to experience as a faculty or staff member. So we want you to refer at that moment. Questions on these? I see everybody is pretty alarmed by the content of what I've shared. So I want to pause here and I want to just, um, I, I want to remind everyone that these are very rare, right? We're, just, we're talking about managing dangerous or disruptive students, but they, they are a small segment of what happens. It's similar to what we do when we do um, run, hide, fight. Um, we need to learn it because even though it's so rare, it's important that it's in our brain, that we know what to do when that situation arises. These are very, very rare and you have a ton of support. That's sort of why our office exist. So um, 
you know, that's, that's the point of us being here today, not to sort of scare, but to, to let you know that there's help and there's resources. And our goal is to really help students be as successful as possible with a lot of the challenges they're coming in with. I would say the distracting, I have had the snide eye, eye rolling stuff. I mean, I had a student who couldn't stop, her eyes could not leave the ceiling the entire semester. And, you know, to some extent, I think there's way more on this end yeah. Yeah, than there is yeah. in the middle or on the end. And so, you know, thinking through some strategies, and I'm going to say this for the benefit of everyone in the room and the recording, you know, part of what the Dutton Institute can do is to help with, if you've got stuff on this end and it's not going over here, you know, we have strategies that we can use both in class and online to help minimize some of that stuff. So, I was just going to make the same point that I yeah. think distracting is the thing that we get the most calls about. Mm -hmm. And those are, those are the things that um, almost every faculty has some experience with at some level. Um, but I, I, not but, and I would also acknowledge though that because some of those distracting behaviors are more common, there's not that feeling that I need to address it. It's like, oh, so this happens all the time, right? And then what happens is that we don't address it at the distracting level right. and it becomes disruptive. And then we get to that place where it's like, okay, now something has to happen. Um, so I think part of acknowledging uh, even the continuum is to, to reinforce that uh, probably all of these behaviors are worthy of some acknowledgement. Um, the, to what degree is really going to be up to a faculty member's comfort. Um, and, and so, but also be aware that oftentimes when we don't address it at the distracting level, um, there, there are those chances that it, it's going to evolve. And sometimes makes the student a little bit more, um, frustrated because they, they weren't aware perhaps of, um, of how their behavior was being received. Received. And so it can be really helpful to intervene as early as possible. There are a lot of reasons why we don't though. So we're going to talk just very briefly about barriers to addressing concerns. Um, so sometimes we're afraid of upsetting someone. If a student is already saying things that indicate they're upset, we don't want to, you know, upset them further, which is very natural. Um, fear of violating their free speech. A lot of times um, faculty members will call for consultation and say, I don't know what I'm allowed to say. I don't know what I'm allowed to do at this point. So we're going to talk about that next, which I think is another common barrier though. And sometimes we're even upset about our, ourselves getting upset. Like if I try and intervene in this way, maybe, maybe I'm pretty uncomfortable with the fact that they were texting explicit things and I'm not sure how I feel about having to regulate that. So those kinds of things can really be a normal barrier, which is why I think the resources that Steve is talking about are wonderful so that we can just all gain some comfort with that management part of the continuum. And I'll pass it off to Karen. And I, and I just want to add to that. I also think that there are sometimes that faculty don't feel like it's their job. Um, you know, that, that something happens in the classroom that feels a little bit, uh, again, either distracting or disruptive. And, and there's a feeling like, okay, that's, I'm, I am here to teach. I am here to focus on these things. Um, and that's fair. I, I don't disagree with that. I, I think though, part of what we have is there are some students who they may experience the distracting behavior in one class and then they do it in another class and then they do it in another class. And so, although it may not be the role of the faculty member necessarily, and, and it is something that I think faculty can, can keep in mind as helping themselves, but also helping others because it's setting a precedent, it's setting a standard. Um, if these things aren't allowed in your classroom, um, then it makes a statement. Um, but it, it can feel though sometimes challenging. So we're gonna move to uh, talking a little bit about free speech and academic freedom. Um, as Natalie just mentioned, I, I do think that there are many times where a faculty member doesn't feel like, what am I allowed to do? Uh, what, what is it that I can say? What is it that I shouldn't say? Um, and I'm not a free speech expert, so I, I want to make that clear right from the start. And, and I think that part of what we want to address really is what kind of, 
kind of expectations do you set out right at the beginning when you're setting up the tone for your classroom? And uh, something that Stevie has worked on that at some point people will, will have a chance to see is actually setting the tone of the classroom. And that, that ties into this in terms of people speaking out, the content of what they say, how that may be heard. Um, in, in essence, just because, again, a, a, a person's opinion, they have a right to have. They have a right to disagree. How they do that in the context of the classroom may be more of what you're responding to. And making those distinctions is really important because we need to be careful that we're not shutting down some perspectives and not others. And sometimes that's a feeling that students have is this other person is acting the same way, but they're saying things that the faculty member agrees with, so the faculty member's not responding. But I've just said something that they don't agree with, so now they're gonna shut us down. And those are gonna be challenges that students throw out there. Um, free speech is one of those things that, you know, we have students um, who, who are coming forward and that's their first question. Are you, gonna, are you gonna shut down my voice? Are you going to limit what I can say in this classroom? And again, when we're talking about students talking about what the classroom is based on, hopefully that's really gonna be okay. That, that, that type of conversation is gonna be okay. But it's when they, they start to move to other areas or they start to make other judgments or they start to make some of those threatening comments that's when you want to be sure that there's some kind of response. So I would encourage faculty to always think about on that first day of class, in that first conversation with class in the syllabus, to be talking about the difference between we want everyone to feel like they have a voice in this environment, but how you have a voice is really what's important. And there are times when that content may be wavering from what the content of this course is, and the faculty member is in control of that. And that's where we kind of move to the academic freedom piece. And I don't know how many faculty realize that the university actually has a policy on academic freedom. And what it does is it really entitles faculty to essentially control the focus of the classroom. So a faculty can essentially say, this, this is gonna be the limit of the conversation that we're gonna have. And student, you're taking us into another direction, and that direction is not fitting with what we're intended to talk about today. Um, and we've seen some really tangible things about that in online chat rooms, online discussion boards, where people start up a, a, a tangent, and it's going totally out of the direction of what the faculty's intention is. And the question is, well, because students have free speech, can we remove that from the discussion post? Well, yes, you can. It, it is not part of what that intended conversation is on that online discussion board, right? Now, if the student just gives a different opinion about what's being discussed, then we're back to free speech. But if it's disruptive, or it, again, it goes back to that the tone of it is, is abusive or abrasive. There is nothing wrong with having that conversation with the student, but whether or not you take that off of the online chat room or the online discussion board, that's when, when there's, some, there's some questions there. And, and again, I am not an expert and I always encourage people, these are things you ask questions about, okay? So if a student has, has done something, said something, put something on an online discussion board, again, for faculty, know that university policy gives you rights to control the environment of your classroom. And if, if that is going off kilter, you've got some rights. How you do that, though, um, look to for support. Um, and know that there are people at the university who can help you talk through that situation. Um, best practices, again, um, how we present ourselves as faculty, I think it's always important to, to keep in mind that we're role modeling the behavior that we want. Um, so the more that we can 
be clear in our communication. The more that we can um, show respect and, and allow people to have a voice, more likely it is it's gonna be mirrored. Uh, the more likely we are to stick to, to the subject as opposed to, okay, well today there's really something interesting in the news and I'm going to bring that up. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I really think it's of interest because you all are students at this institution, for example. That may be fine to do, but then the, the next time the student brings up an issue and says, hey, faculty, I really would like to talk about this. And you say, sorry, we are really sticking to our, our syllabus. Well, it's not that that's not a, a wrong thing for a faculty member to do, but it you understand why a, fa a, a student may say, well, why is it okay for you to do and not okay for me to do? Now, again, expectations in the classroom, the more that you're able to role model, I think the better. Um, we have had situations where a faculty member will escalate a situation because the student yells and the faculty yells out. The student becomes aggressive and the faculty becomes more aggressive. Um, and I understand where some of that anxiety or fear may come from. Um, so it's one of those things where you, you think about the skills that you take when somebody does something disruptive. Uh, it's always good to just kind of take a minute and think about, okay, what am I, what am I needing to do here? And, and am I needing to react in the moment or not? Is it something that would be better dealt with after class? Is it something that would be better dealt with in a follow-up email or not? Is it disruptive and it's causing issues in the classroom right now and it needs to be addressed? So always encourage faculty to kind of check themselves as they're responding. Um, in terms of your rights, faculty have rights, absolutely. And it is important that they understand that they are in control of that classroom environment. Um, in terms of expectations, I don't know how often it is that, that people take a look at some of the guidelines that there are for faculty. Uh, and there are many of them in terms of the university's uh, administrative policies. So encourage you to take a look at those. Um, see the ones that, that are directly related to you. Um, again, I don't know how often it is people read the academic freedom policy, um, but that's an important one because it does kind of give you guidelines for what you can do in the classroom. Um, and always seek out help. Always know that there are people here to, to help and that chances are this may be a first experience for you to deal with, but it's probably not the first experience for others that you reach out to dealing with it. Not that every situation isn't potentially unique because just about every day we see something that we didn't think we'd ever see. Um, but chances are we've talked through situations in a different way before and we've done it more often. Um, so know that seeking out for help is, is one way to um, get support for you as a faculty member. All right, next we're going to sort of connect all of this to the Red Folder initiatives. So I've brought some of those for you. Do you need one, Karen, or do you already no, have one? I'm okay. Um, so the Red Folder Initiative is a joint project between Counseling and Psychological Services, Student Affairs more broadly, and then um, UPUA. And it's a guide so that everyone, can, did you get one? Did you? Oh, here, I have an extra. Oh, you have, yeah. Okay, I'm going to be yeah. asking you for a bunch of these. Okay. Great. Warn you ahead um, of so it's, a, it's this quick reference guide for recognizing, responding to, and referring to stressed students, which is similar to the continuum that we talked about today. Um, and inside, there's a nice sort of decision tree of what you're supposed to do. So once you've recognized those indicators of distressed students, and you can see that there's various sort of containers where some of that distress lives, um, the academic, the physical, the psychological, and then the safety um, area. So once you've recognized, you can respond, and the respond section is really, really important. It feels like things we all know, 
But I'm amazed at how anytime we are under stress or a little bit vulnerable, it's almost like we flip the lid on our frontal lobe. It just goes like right off out of commission. And all of a sudden we're only acting from a place of like a, like a very sort of primal fight or flight response. So I think that what we love about this folder is it can live somewhere in your office where you can always just kind of grab it and remind yourself like, what well, haven't I tried yet with regard to responding? And then on the back, there's all of the referral options. And you can see that it's a little bit small print because there's so many different places you can refer to. Um, so we're going to review some of those resources where you can refer to. But on the back where it says, is the student a danger to themselves or others, or does the student need some other assistance? You can walk yourself right down the line and say, the student's conduct is clearly dangerous or threatening, including self-harm to others. Yep, call 911 or the Penn State Police. Like that is what needs to happen in that moment. A lot of times mm -hmm. faculty members might write an email to our general email inbox and say, this student was threatening me today. You know, what's my next move? And I'm thinking we want you to get safe right away. Like that's what we need you to do right away. I wouldn't want you to wait for, you know, our general email inquiry to be responded to, to tell you to do that. So this hopefully will get people exactly where they need to. And then if your answer is no, it tells you exactly what you're supposed to do next. Does that all kind of make sense? Okay, this wonderful. Um, so I'll leave you these extra ones so that you have a few. Um, and Stevie, I just, I will let our outreach um, uh, director know that you, that I've I passed like a few off, but you would like more. I will let her know when I get return to the office. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay if I post this with our recording? Um, I don't see why just not. It's for just public just consumption. Yeah, we have 10,000 okay. copies sitting in our um, in our office right now. I'm sorry, did I run over? No. Nope. Oh. No, I just, I think you kind of covered some of the slides and one, uh, go back one more slide. And I was just going to uh, wrap up thinking, if you think back again to the distracting, um, disruptive and dangerous, um, and then you incorporate those concepts with this red folder, um, we just kind of wanted to clarify that like if ever you feel like you or someone else is in danger, never kind of work around university police because they are used to redirecting people if they're not the best place and they're used to getting people out on site or kind of responding quickly. But if you think that maybe someone's more in like acute mental health related distress, um, they can be connected with CAPS um, quickly. We also have the Penn State crisis line, which has um, a therapist on the phone that can then initiate mobile, uh, mobile unit to come straight to where the student is. Um, it might not always be ideal to walk someone over and I, that can be kind of a long walk even if it's just a short distance. Um, so just kind of remember again, safety in those situations. Um, and then student care and advocacy, the department that I represent um, can really, if you think of kind of, we, we're not clinicians, but we can kind of help and from like a social work kind of perspective with kind of everything else related to or kind of that's impacted by that distress. Um, so if you're, um, you know, we're actually also probably a little more likely to be available on a quick walk-in basis, especially if the person isn't in um, significant distress or need police attention. And so don't, don't forget about us, but also don't put us in front of um, police if somebody really, if you are really in a dangerous or um, really disruptive situation. And it is mandated reporting. Should we briefly talk through? Yes. Okay. So I, I think everyone um, in the room knows that they are a responsible employee for, it, you've already all reviewed all of that and you're, okay, then we, we don't need to hit that at all. I do think it's important to know that there are actually yeah. in a different category, a confidential category, and that's CAPS and the Gen X Center. And then it also applies for the Cedar Clinic, which is another sort of on-campus clinic for mental health. We, we send them most of their referrals, but anytime someone's in the therapy context, they're considered confidential. So if a student is starting to edge on telling you something that you think this might mm -hmm. be reportable, it's, it's not good to stop the student, but it is helpful to sort of say, it sounds like where you're heading. I guess I just want to remind you that there are some options on campus where if you want to talk completely confidentially, I want to let you know where those are, but I also am here if you'd like to talk to me and, and there's something you want to share with me. I just want to make it clear that there are a couple places on campus. Yeah, I think it's worth the time you take to pause mm -hmm. versus kind of like <laughs> trying to backtrack it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um, I'll just take that time. I'm going to ask you a question that I get asked fairly often. Mm -hmm. Um, student in a class, online usually, but I imagine this could also happen residentially, 
acting a little off, a little odd, not asking for help, are they allowed to approach the student and suggest that they might consider seeing CAPS? That's the, the instructors really feel uncomfortable about, I've seen all this very strange behavior, they're exhibiting all this strange stuff, but they haven't come to me with a question, nothing's been clear, nothing's been overt. <laughs> Can I suggest, like, it feels to them like they're saying, you really need some help. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. they, they're, they're uncomfortable with that. Is mm -hmm. that permitted? Yeah. I, I mean, I think you're always permitted to offer resources. And I, I had a situation like that arise with an online student I was, I was instructing in the past. And I just asked if he would stay back in the room, mm -hmm. um, the virtual room, after the other students had exited. And I just, I, I talked about the behaviors I noticed. I noticed you're not engaging the way you did initially. I noticed you seem really not yourself. You seem, you know, I, I mm -hmm. called attention to all the behaviors I saw, mm -hmm. which is usually a safe way to start with a student. Um, and, and then and then leaving an opening can you tell me a little bit about what's going on is there anything you're feeling like you need assistance with to be successful in this class sometimes the student will then say some of the stressors that are going on and it's an opening mm -hmm. and if the student chooses not to and says no I, there isn't anything that I need it's not bad practice for a faculty member to say I'm just gonna send you a bunch of resources you can do or not do what you want with them but I just feel like I want you to know that as a student you have free help available mm -hmm. so I'm just gonna send them to you but please know I I do that as a matter of course like I do that with all students that are just feeling like they're like not themselves or sort of struggling a little bit in my class I let them know of everything and having a nice template response that lists academic resources as well as counseling and psychological resources mm -hmm. kind of covers you from feeling like you're saying you need some help but like we all need help you don't have a template for that do you Maybe that's <laughs> actually the <next> thing. <laughs> I do have, I, I love that and I, I have something that I could kind of I, that, I think that would be great I think that would be great it's not uncommon to members. Yeah. No, and no, I no. wouldn't recommend I think the what makes uh, people nervous about identifying saying I think you should go to caps is like I wouldn't lead actually with right. with caps necessarily I like how Natalie was kind of these are the behaviors I'm witnessing even if it's somebody maybe on the spectrum that isn't aware of social cues and is like interrupting fellow classmates that's a behavior that you could you know you don't you're not having to diagnose them or saying that they even need mental health you know interaction it's just uh identifying the behaviors and then sending like robust resources even including like campus rec and wellness like um and I would even, I, I think, take it even um, further and say we, I don't, I don't think we want you to diagnose it. Right. And, oh, and I'm I, sure they, and I'm I think sure that that's, they want to. Well, I, I think we have had both. Really? I think, I Watch think a we, lot of TV. We, we, <laughs> we, we, we Everybody have, wants to be helped. <laughs> we do at times, and, and I think that somehow that that is what then gets delivered. Yeah. Um, and there's a judgment there that right. comes out, uh, and it may not be intended, but that's what comes out. And 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 I think that part of the reason why we talk about all of these resources is really to say, you don't need to feel like you're an expert on any of this. You don't you don't need to feel like okay, look at all these situations. I I'm supposed to be able to interpret that. No, you're not. And I think as Natalie said. Um, it's so important is you see behaviors mm -hmm. and it's it's being able to talk with somebody about here's what I see is different are you okay showing concern um, and I think that's that's where we really want faculty to feel like yes that that's the part that that I think they play a really important role in is is acknowledging those kinds of uh, differences in mm -hmm. behavior. Anything else? That's all for us. Mm -hmm. uh, any last questions? Questions? Did you look like you had a question earlier. Did you get one? Oh, I did. Okay. <laughs> you have an open face. It's very nice. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I think I was thinking about things that have happened in classrooms and somebody would tell me, like, yeah, something that I forgot to have for <laughs> Yes. Yeah, that's don't hesitate to call and consult. I mean, if, if I had a student that was struggling in your class or your department, like I would call you and consult and say, you know, I, I want to help provide the, the student the best, you know, possible experience here. I've been here for almost a year, and I've already done, I've already noticed three of these four things as a referral to public places, and I'm currently experiencing a disruptive or a, dis, or a disrespectful student. Okay. But I think it's 
but distraction is like a really important thing. I think sometimes what can also uh, kind of a barrier to interviewing is you're like, I can't believe this student is 18 or older and no one has ever given them feedback on this Absolutely. or that. So just, I guess kind of if you can swallow that and just be like, I have the honor of being the first yeah. person to give them feedback on this <laughs> and yeah. I'm saving all my colleagues trouble. Like sometimes I think feedback, think of if ever you were bothering someone and they didn't tell you, you'd be like, I, you got to let me know so I can get better or just give me a chance to get better. So just give them a chance, and then if they don't, then that you know we can implement other things. But I think sometimes it's just frustrating because you feel like why? Well, why it's always a violation of expectations, and like that always awesome. takes us right out of our game. Like we're trying to do our job, yeah. and then all of a sudden you're like, well, now I'm not doing my job. <laughs> I'm having to do this other thing, and that wasn't what I expected. It's it's very complicated. So. Gorgeous, and I think too, you know because distracting students or disrespecting students, I think. The beauty, too, of, of the work that we do together is that you can probably connect with any of those resources, and we're, we're going to get you to where yeah. it makes sense to go. So it may very well be that somebody is disrespectful, but what comes out of that is uh, potentially autism spectrum or something else where, where it does make sense to engage with someone else. So it, know that if you go to any of the resources, we work really closely with each other uh, because many of these things fall along the spectrum back and forth. Yeah, I hadn't really thought of, um, I mean, I had just this student, I, 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 I am thinking of this as an intersectional student, I think, mm -hmm. um, like there's a bit of gender discrimination that's going on, mm -hmm. as well as spectrum, mm -hmm. being on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. sure. um, and, but I didn't really think of CAP as being an organization that deals with helping people on the spectrum I, I hadn't really ever thought yeah, we about have that. a group for students on the um, spectrum. We have special, yeah, we have two um, psychologists who I would say that's like an area of specialty yeah. for them. Um, can be enormously helpful. There's also a, um, a support group on campus, I think, that Joyce Perfaro runs. Um, and there's several resources in town. But, uh, but by giving a general sort of um, response of different resources that are available, and, and CAPS being one of them, we can then screen and sort of route someone appropriately. So it can be really helpful. And, and we still don't take away the behavior. So there are many mm -hmm. students You're we right. have who, who are going through a university conduct process in terms of the support mm -hmm. from these two other offices. So it's, it's, it's also being really clear that you know the behavior, there's no excuse for the behavior. That this may give us more insight about why that's happening, yeah. or or why there it's not stopping. Um, but it when it still reaches that threshold to address, still have to. Yeah. We always say it's an explanation; it's not an not excuse. excuse. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very yeah, much. Thanks for having us. Really, it was great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah,